if you want to catch this show and or contact us, we are available on a number of different mediums. Uh, you can check out all of our content on SB Nation's fan site for the Bengals, Cincy Jungle. All of our stuff is on there, whether it's uh, posts regarding the segments on our show or the podcast itself, that's there. We also have SoundCloud and YouTube channels. Uh, you can subscribe to those. And we do this show live every week, both on Cincy Jungle and in, on YouTube. So uh, you can join us in the chats there and uh, submit some questions in those chat rooms. We'll try and get to those. And we're also available on iTunes for download, or you can contact us via Twitter if you're on there, at BanglesOBI, or via email, theobinsider at gmail.com. All right, self-promotion aside, Scott, um, let's continue with Again, we, we do these positional assessments. I think they've been really fun to do, both looking back at some of the issues that plagued positional units um, at in 2016, which uh, not many, <laughs> very few positional groups were immune to criticism last year. But um, also what's ahead for some of these groups, What who the team might add, some interesting names, uh, might it be free agency or the draft or both. Um, and this position is one, I, well, we're going to try and talk about two if we have enough time here. Let's start with the wide receivers. Both of these, but th this, this position group is very interesting to me in 2017, okay? So the team has star receiver A.J. Green, who was on pace to have what seemed like a career year last year. Unfortunately, he got hurt uh, towards the tail end of the season and missed the last, I believe, six games. Um, just fell short of his sixth straight thousand yard season uh, if you know aj green is a competitor and uh some some rumors had him a little upset about him not suiting up he thought he may be able to suit up towards the end of the year but uh, the Bengals didn't push it um didn't want that hamstring injury to get worse and and even though they were still theoretically alive at the end of the season for the playoff push uh for the playoff picture that is i i think there most fans would say you know long term this is a guy that maybe has you know four five six years left let's not risk something incredibly uh, incredibly damaging to him long term and uh, obviously the team felt that way and uh, unfortunately his his vacancy was was felt in the offense as the year wore on Brandon LaFell stepped up uh, did play pretty well throughout the rest of the season uh, Tyler Boyd had some nice moments Cody core in very limited action uh, another rookie had had a couple of nice plays though. Again, very limited uh, in terms of, of his snaps and all of that. Alex Erickson, same kind of deal. So I guess, Scott, looking at 2016 and into 2017, is this a group because there were basically three rookies and one new guy off the street? Th there were a lot of good moments from this group, but there were a ton of dry spells as well from this group. Is it because of all of the new personnel and, and the lack of uh, really that group having a lot of experience together that we saw with Andy Dalton, Green, Mohamed Sanu, and Marvin Jones? Or do, does the team need a uh, an elite playmaker going into 2017 opposite of A.J. Green while these young guys continue to develop and maybe supplement those, uh, you know, a new, a new star receiver alongside A.J. Green? I think if you're looking at uh, as far as the production, I think there are probably two big things. One, um, that probably can't be understated. We lost uh, Jay Gruden a few years ago. We lost Hugh Jackson last year. So we're breaking in a brand new offensive coordinator who had never been an offensive coordinator before. And I think we saw that, especially early in the year with the play calling, some of the the way the offense was trying to move, how it didn't move. So I think that definitely hurt some things. Uh, and then also, as you mentioned, there were a lot of young guys. So outside of LaFell and Green, and obviously, as you mentioned, I mean, Green is elite. He is one of the top receivers in the NFL. Outside of them, it's just a very young, very inexperienced group. Uh, your top receivers after those top two were Tyler Boyd, who was a true rookie, Cody Core, who was also a true rookie, James Wright, who got in a little bit at the end, who is uh, has been there a few years, has never really emerged much as a receiver. Alex Erickson, who was also a rookie. So it's a yeah, it's just a very very young group that you just really need to see take the next step and you uh, you've made a very good point about uh, what what they may do as far as going forward and that's a very interesting thing because if you look at the roster as it stands right now aj green i mean obviously you know he is uh, great outside of him 
you have a lot of questions because you have Boyd going into second year. He he did pretty well his first year, 600 yards, 54 receptions, uh, only one touchdown, but the whole offense was kind of down in that regard. So he looked like he took some step you know, in the right direction for a rookie. Outside of that, you had Cody Core who flashed some uh, a few nice things, especially later in the season. And outside of that, you just have a whole lot of – you know, you just don't know what you have after that because – James Wright, he's in, and he's in his last season. He's never really emerged. Uh, Alec Erickson, for, for playing, being active every game, he only caught six passes. So they obviously don't see him as much a receiver. You don't know if that's going to change going forward or if they just see him as a punt return guy who probably could be fighting for his job next year. And, you know, he may not even be on the roster, depending on who they bring in into the draft, who they bring in during free agency, if they think he gets, you know, beat by someone as far as a punt returner. If they never cut Adam Jones, you know, that might be another possibility as far as returning. Uh, and then behind that, you have guys who have never really played. Jake Kumro, who we talk about every training camp, is this, you know, this is going to be the year. Then you have uh, Chris Brown and Alonzo Russell, who are both kind of practice squad futures kind of players. So you don't really have a whole lot of experience. And it kind of makes you think they're probably going to sign someone as a free agent just because this is a team who likes veterans and just having that being that sparse it's just really hard to imagine them not bringing someone in at the very least for depth someone who you know is probably going to make the roster probably he you know they may not become the number two uh but someone who is going to provide a little stability a little bit that veteran presence that marvin lewis likes the one encouraging thing is your top three receivers depending on how you look at it i would argue aj green tyler boyd cody core are your top three receivers. All three of them are signed for 2017, 2018, and 2019. So that is the one encouraging thing is you've got three guys all locked up for three more years. If they use a high pick or medium pick on another receiver, you figure that guy's probably in the mix in the top four as it stands right now. And he would also be locked up for three, four, five years, depending on where they draft him. So that is the one encouraging thing is that uh, for as old as they're getting in other positions, we've talked before about their window declining. Yeah. This is kind of the one encouraging thing is, hey, you've got an elite receiver, and your next few guys you've got locked up for a while. So assuming they take that next step, assuming guys like Core and Boyd can emerge, and I think the big thing with um, Boyd, which probably affects the direction they go, is what do they see Tyler Boyd doing going forward? Do they see him as nothing more than he's just an inside guy, slot guy, you know, he's the guy who's going to be in there, but he's not that true number two. He's not that Marvin Jones. He's not that second guy. Or do they see him – as that second guy and depending on what the Bengals answer to that question is which we probably don't know right now that probably affects the direction they would go as far as free agency and then in April in the draft if they would really seriously question you know taking a guy high or if they feel no we're pretty comfortable these are our top two guys we just need to fill in you know some depth here and there yeah it's a, it's a great point about Boyd and you know, it's it's kind of funny. If you were to look back at like 1990s NFL offenses, early 2000s NFL offenses, you kind of had the traditional package. You had your star big guy, and then you had the guy that was more of the chain mover who played more outside. And, you know, the slot thing wasn't really talked about until really the past five or ten years. And now offenses are far more complex, and teams are specifically seeking out guys that can play in the slot. And Boyd seems to be that guy. Now, it's a great question to ask with his, you know, where do they see him fitting in? Is he a guy that can do both? Is he a guy that can play outside and inside? Is he is he more of a, a little bit slighter Mohamed Sanu where his strength is strictly in the slot and, and moving the chains, making those tough catches? That's what we saw mostly out of him last year. Now, he was pushed to the outside a little bit with the, in, with the injury. But, uh, you know, I, 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 it's, very, it's very difficult to predict what the Bengals see out of him in terms of long-term viability on the outside or if he is a guy uh, on the inside that they say, you know, we still need another outside option, uh, whether it's a speedy guy, whether it's LaFell, whether it's a guy in the draft, whatever the case may be, um, it, it, you bring up a great, great point about Boyd with that. Now, if you were, and, and I don't want to spoil this for later because one of our fan questions kind of revolves around this. Now, Scott, would you prefer, do, do you think 
Brandon LaFell, because he had his second best season as a pro under the Bengals last year, statistically speaking, uh, second really only to the season he had with Tom Brady and the Patriots, which uh, in itself is impressive. So do you think he is the best plan of action for the Bengals to move forward in 2017? Or should they really look at using a, a top 10 pick on an elite, a quote unquote elite talent at wide receiver, maybe a top of the second round, or maybe someone else who's a bit younger in free agency than Brandon LaFell? I think a, if it was me, I'd probably lean towards someone like a LaFell, someone like an older free agent. And the only reason I say that is I'd, I'd really like to see Boyd get a chance. And what I, in the, and what I saw, I thought he did really well. And unfortunately, if they let's say they take um, someone like uh, the kid from Western Kentucky or the kid from Clemson at number nine overall, that player's probably going to see a lot of snaps. You know, it would be kind of silly to draft. I know we talk about them not starting guys they draft in the first round. That's usually on defense. Uh, on offense, they tend to start the guys more often than not as soon as they draft them. Uh, but that brings the question, okay, now we have A.J. Green. You have, let's say, Mike Williams, just for the sake of argument. And you have Tyler Boyd. So you have three fairly young, really good receivers. The problem is I don't think our offense, you know, we're not the New Orleans Saints. We're not a team. I don't think the offensive coordinator, I don't think the pass protection is such that we're going to stand back there and fling it 40, 50 times a game to justify having all three of them. And then, oh, by the way, you have Tyler Reifert and Giovanni Bernard, who are both very good pass receivers for their positions. So just from that perspective, based on the way the offense is set up, especially since they always say we want to run, we want to run, you know, we have just two running backs where even if we get two yards of carry, we're going to keep running on first down, we're going to run on second down. I just, I'm, I'd be surprised to see that investment pay off unless they, uh, unless there's something they're, you know, they're planning in the works that, that the fans don't see as far as, what they're going to do with this offense or a direction they're going to take. So assuming they don't use a high pick on receiver, then that brings to the free agent question. And the only reason I say a veteran guy over a young guy is just because a lot of the guys we have now with core Boyd and court and Boyd are both young already. Uh, Green's obviously your one old guy, old, old compared to the group, obviously is still pretty young is the idea that, you know, you'd like to have someone in there who, who, you know, you could, who could step in right now. You're not really looking for a guy with, a whole lot of upside, but someone that, you know, okay, this guy knows what they're doing, kind of like what Brandon LaFell did. He came in, he's a professional, he steps right in, he kind of knows his role. You know you're not going to, you're not really projecting him long-term, but you don't have to because you have Boyd and Cora sitting there, and potentially, you know, someone else, depending if they do draft someone. So I think because of that, you'd probably want someone that could step in, ideally behind Boyd. If Green gets hurt, if Boyd doesn't take that step forward, if Cora doesn't take that step forward, you have that third option. Yeah, and the whole thing with the wide receiver group in 2017, and I, I'm going back to kind of how I started this segment is, what is it? Is it simply growth and continuity that that's going to make the team better on offense in 2017? Especially if you bring back LaFell, his second year in the system, Boyd, second year in the system, Core, second year in the system, Erickson, second year in the system. Is is it simply? getting those guys more reps, more time in this Bengals system and building the uh, the rapport that Sanu Jones Green had with Andy Dalton, or is it is it a talent issue? Is it, you know, LaFell did, did great things. Maybe he overachieved a little bit based on his career stats. Um, and the fact that he was basically the number one receiver once Green went down and, and was seeing more targets as the season wore on. Um, you know, C Cody Kaur has a lot of physical skills and a lot of traits you like, but he was a sixth-round pick. Erickson, undrafted guy. Boyd, you know, a second-round pick. So I, I guess the team needs to figure out if it's, if it's continuity and, hey, let's get these guys together. Let's build what we once had with this group um, or is it, you know, we need an influx of talent or is it both? Do you have any thoughts on that, Scott? I, I guess I'd say for me, it's, I, I think it's kind of hard to judge that only because the, the offensive line just struggled so much this year when Smith was, and a lot of people yeah. were, um, I never thought 
seem to think Smith was as bad as a lot of people thought he was. But there was a huge drop off to Abuehi, especially early in the year, where Abuehi was constantly getting beat. Uh, you know, we've obviously talked about how Bodine gets beat. Uh, Whitworth was still good. He wasn't the same Whitworth of a couple years ago, where he gave up like what zero sacks and hardly any pressures. Uh, so just and then uh, Clint Bowling on the left side was injured, playing all year hurt. So you you really didn't have the time for the guys to always get open. And I think sometimes you saw times where. It, Dalton did have the opportunity, and the receivers just weren't getting open. But then you saw other times where he just didn't have the time to throw the ball. And you yeah. could say, well, no one was open. But, you you know, it's only a one or two seconds in, and we weren't – for some reason, we just – and I think this goes back to offensive coordinator, too, is if you're getting beat, if your offensive line isn't giving you the time to block, you've got to run the the shorter routes. You've got to find a way – kind of like what, what, what the Patriots seem to do. They always run those quick little slants. They always, you know, have that little – that Wes Welker, Chris Hogue. You know, someone, Julian Edmund, that's going to run that three, four, five-yard slant and run it, and you're going to have your, you know, receivers. And routes, yeah, that, yeah that someone's always going to be – the Bengals, for whatever reason, we're not doing that. They're just, no, we're going to run a more traditional offense. You know, the guys are going to run medium, longer routes. And, oh, in the meantime, Dalton Sack. And – so I, I think that's part of it, too. It's really hard to say because Dalton's you know, season wasn't as good, but at the same time, if you're not getting the blocking and you're taking away his top receivers and you're insisting on running and the and you're letting the defense kind of dictate the situation because we weren't scoring, their teams, we weren't leading. And obviously, you know, you have offense and defense kind of go together. And I think that's another thing that sometimes might is getting overlooked is that, okay, last year we had this great offense. We were able to score a lot of points. So what happens when we do that? We're forcing teams to play catch up. That lets our defense, you know, play a little more pressure because we know they have to throw a little more. We can kind of dictate it. And then when we're leading, you know, we can run the ball. We can kind of dictate what we do. We can throw when we want to when they're trying to stop the run. This time around, we were playing catch up a lot more often. So they knew we had to throw and, and we were fairly predictable in our, and when we threw. So I think a lot of those things just all went together to work against us. So it's, it's really hard to, you know, isolate one variable from that and say, this is what, what hurt the Bengals in 2017. Yeah. And it, you know, it's, it's a great point you bring up about the pressure and the issue of guys not getting open when there was a clean pocket. And that's what makes this, uh, this is why I don't envy the Bengals front office when it comes to talking about the wide receiver and tight end positions this year, because Obviously, you want to fix the line, whatever that may be. Maybe there's more experience from Fisher and Abwehi that helps. You know, you re-sign Zeitler and or Whitworth, and, and, you know, you hope for better results there. Um, but as the year wore on, you definitely saw guys not being able to get open with regularity. And then, but, that, you, you know, the flip side of that is, well, is that just because A.J. Green and Tyler Eifert were hurt um, and out of the lineup, and so defenses didn't respect it? But then you look at that and you say, okay, maybe that's a, maybe that's a depth and talent issue behind those guys being hurt. Um, obviously, Tyler Eifert's a very talented guy, but he's missed a lot of time. So, uh, you know, you need to have able replacements if those guys go down. 